Hello everyone and welcome to a very special episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Nessier and today I'm out at the range looking at rifle grenades. Now I'm dressed in very Farby French uniform because originally I was only going to look at this rifle from my personal collection. This is a Moss 3651, it's a post-war variant of the World War II era French Moss 36 bolt-action rifle with a strengthened barrel and a NATO standard 22mm grenade launching spigot added to it. But because I have friends in very interesting places, I actually managed to get my hands on two other rifles with grenade launching systems. A British short magazine Lee Enfield or SMLE with a 2.5 inch Burns discharger cup, and a German Mauser KR98K with a Schiesbecher discharger cup. And all three of those use very different systems for uh, varying the range of the grenade, and since this channel is all about unique ways of solving problems, I thought I would demonstrate all three of them for you and show you how they work. And yes, I did say demonstrate them. We will be firing all three of these rifles here on the range for you, so stay tuned to the end for all the good stuff. But in the meantime, a little history. So grenades in one form or another have existed basically since the invention of gunpowder in China in the 10th century AD. And the very first grenades consisted of lengths of bamboo or containers made of clay or bronze or iron filled with gunpowder and fitted with a piece of quick match as a fuse. And grenades in this configuration first appeared in Europe around the 15th and 16th centuries, and this is where they got their modern name. At the time, people thought that this round casing full of very coarse grains of gunpowder looked like the seeds of a pomegranate, which in French is grenade, in Italian is granata, so on and so forth, hence we get the name grenade. And this is the form that the grenade stayed in for about 300 years, and it found its way into the heraldic symbols of a lot of different military units, including the French Foreign Legion. Now, one of the reasons for this sort of stagnation in technology, why the grenade really didn't change all that much for that many centuries, was it wasn't a very popular weapon to begin with. It was mostly associated with siege warfare. And so when siege warfare uh, went out of style, so did the grenade, because you basically only used it for attacking or defending fortified positions. And whenever you get a return of siege warfare, usually in the form of trench warfare, that's when you see a resurrection of the grenade. So for example, during the American Civil War, where a lot of the battles did devolve into trench warfare, both sides used a version of what was called the Ketchum Grenade. And it was cast iron, and it looked kind of like one of those foam footballs with the fins at the back, with a simple percussion fuse at the end, so it needed to hit head-on in order to detonate. Uh, it wasn't very effective, wasn't reliable due to the technology available at the time, but it was used to a limited extent. But it wouldn't be until the beginning of the 20th century that we would really see this renaissance in grenades, especially during the 1905 Russo-Japanese War, where both sides started improvising grenades out of pieces of iron pipe filled with gunpowder and fitted with a fuse, what we would today call a pipe bomb. Uh, while at the end of the war the Japanese started issuing standard, like, mass-issue grenades, these were little more than mass-produced versions of the improvised grenades that the troops were already making for themselves. So the first real modern grenade really wouldn't show up until 1908, and the British were the first to adopt it. And this grenade was called, appropriately enough, the Grenade Number no. 1. And this is a short piece of iron tube with a fragmentation sleeve around it, a cane handle, and a long piece of ribbon. And the ribbon was there as a stabilization device because this thing didn't have a time fuse like we would see on a modern grenade. It had an impact fuse. So that ribbon was there to make sure that it flew straight and that it hit head on in order to detonate. Now, this is an advance over anything that had come before, but it still wasn't quite perfect. It was unreliable. It could only be manufactured in a couple of factories, so supply was always low. And worse of all, they found that in the trenches, because of this long cane handle, what would happen is the troops would wind back their arm and the percussion fuse would hit the back of the trench and blow them up, which you will recognize as being something of a problem. So later they came up with the number three grenade, which had a shortened handle, which helped things somewhat, uh, but still not an ideal solution. And if you're wondering what the number two grenade was, well, that was something called the Hales grenade, which was... Uh, invented by Martin Hale. It was a private uh, venture, and the British government bought up a bunch of these privately manufactured grenades to make up for the shortfall in the supply of grenade number one. 
but it really wouldn't be until 1915 that we got a proper modern hand grenade. And that was this. This is the Mills bomb invented by William Mills. You can see already this is a huge leap ahead of anything that came before. Uh, this is a fully modern hand grenade. So nice little egg-shaped body with serrations you can grip onto it. And instead of an impact fuse, you have a striker mounted on a spring with a safety pin and a spoon, a little lever on the side. So to use this, you would hold onto the spoon, pull out the pin, and when you threw it, the spoon would flip up, release the firing pin, it would hit the percussion cap, and there'd be around a four second fuse that would detonate. Uh, so a lot safer, a lot more convenient to use than the earlier number one and number three grenades. So this was a huge success. Millions of these were produced. They were integrated into infantry tactics, and the British actually became quite proficient at what they called bombing for raiding trenches. So one of the myths about grenades like this, the mills and later copies of it, like the American M2 pineapple grenade, is that these serrations on the side that give it the pineapple moniker are to increase fragmentation, so it breaks up into a bunch of very sharp fragments. But actually this was originally intended just to give you grip with muddy or wet hands, and in testing they found that it never split up that way anyway. Future grenades that copied it tried to make it split along these lines, but it really never worked. So modern grenades will actually typically have a smooth casing, such as this baseball style grenade, and inside is a fragmentation matrix. So typically it's a piece of coiled wire that's notched every uh, couple of centimeters or so, and those are what form the fragments. And it's a lot more reliable and consistent than trying to put the pattern on the outside of the grenade. So another thing that needs to be noted when it comes to these types of hand grenades is that the fragmentation lethal radius is actually typically a lot larger than the minimum range you can throw this as an infantryman. So you actually have to use these from behind cover, which is why fragmentation grenades are typically known as defensive grenades. You have to be in a defensive position so you don't get hit by your own fragments. Uh, the other type of grenade you can have is called an offensive grenade, and that doesn't have much fragmentation at all. It usually has a smooth body, sometimes even a plastic body, and that just produces blast effect. And so its lethal radius is much smaller than the minimum range you can throw it, and so you can actually use those while on the offensive. And a very famous example of an offensive grenade is this. So the Germans also adopted hand grenades during the First World War, and they went in a bit of a different direction. This is a Stellhandgranat, or stick hand grenade. And this is the World War II version. It's a wooden replica, actually. But the World War I version was pretty much the same. It just had a belt hook and a couple of other features. And the head of this is just thin sheet metal. And so this has more of a blast effect, so you can actually use this while you're on the move. You don't need to duck behind cover. Uh, later during World War II, they would uh, invent something called the Splittering, which was a fragmentation sleeve that fit over the head so you could actually use it as a defensive grenade. Now how you would use this is you would unscrew the cap at the bottom and out would fall a little ceramic bead with a piece of thread. You would pull on the thread and it would activate a friction igniter, which is sort of like striking a match. The Germans loved using these, not a lot of other countries did. They preferred... Uh, percussion igniters and more mechanical means of activating the grenade. And then you have this nice long handle with which to throw it. But even with this handle, about the maximum range you can throw one of these is around 20 to 30 meters if you have a particularly strong arm. And during the First World War, the need arose for a weapon, uh, an explosive weapon, that could bridge the gap between the farthest distance an infantryman could throw a grenade and the shortest range of a small trench mortar. And at first, this need was filled, actually, by miniature catapults, including the West Spring Gun, which was a little trebuchet with very powerful springs and an arm, and you'd put your Mills bomb on it, and it would launch it about 250 meters. As you can imagine, not an ideal solution. It's big, it's bulky, you can't move it around, it's very hard to actually recock. It didn't last very long in service, so finally somebody figured out that you could use an infantryman's regular rifle to launch a grenade, and hence the rifle grenade was born. Now I know some of you are going to say rifle grenades existed beforehand, so yes there are examples of man portable grenade launchers from the 18th and 19th centuries, they're basically a big blunderbuss that would fire one of those cannonball style hand grenades, 
those were extremely rare. Uh, they were used even less frequently than the regular cannonball grenades themselves. So for all intents and purposes, the rifle grenade was born during the First World War. And the very first of these grenades were known as rodded grenades or rod grenades. And this is because it was basically a variant of a Hales grenade or of a Mills bomb with a rod screwed into the base. And that rod would be inserted into the muzzle of a rifle. You'd load a blank cartridge, and when you fired the cartridge, it would shoot the rod and the grenade out of the barrel. Very simple. It was somewhat effective, but unfortunately it was very inaccurate. And also the problem was, because it takes so much more pressure over a longer period of time to launch a heavy grenade out of the barrel compared to a lightweight bullet, the barrels were prone to ring bulging. They would be deformed by the sudden increase in pressure, especially right behind the rod. And after a couple of firings, uh, these rifles would become useless as regular infantry weapons. They would just be shaken to pieces. And so the British took to designating specific rifles for launching grenades, and everybody else would carry regular rifles. Again, not an ideal solution, but it worked, until they came up with something better, which is the Burns Discharger Cup, which we'll be looking at an example of in a little bit. And this was a metal cup that screwed onto the end of the rifle, and then you had your Mills bomb with a gas check plate screwed into the base, and that would be inserted into the cup. You'd load a blank cartridge again, and when you fired, the gas would push against the gas check plate and launch the grenade out of the cup. And this was far less damaging to the barrel of the weapon, though the stock would get deformed and cracked and loosened, and these rifles were still not great for marksmanship after they were used a couple of times to launch grenades. But it worked. And the British weren't the only ones to develop a system like this. The French also had their own system called the Vivien Biesel Grenade. And this is actually quite interesting because it allowed you to use a live ball round rather than having to carry around blanks, which is great logistically. And you don't have to worry about the, you know, the possibility of, oh, you've loaded a live round into a live grenade and you blow yourself up. So the Vivienne Biesel system, like the British one, was a large cup that fitted to the end of a standard Lebel service rifle, but the grenade was cylindrical. It had a channel running through the center, and protruding out into that channel was a little leaf spring attached to a firing pin and a detonator. And so what you would do is when you fired a live round through this, the bullet would hit that spring, launch the firing pin into the primer, and start the four-second fuse, and then the gas coming up behind the bullet would push the grenade out and launch it. So very innovative system, and it was very effective. Now, rifle grenades proved uh, effective enough and useful enough during the First World War to warrant further development in between the wars, and some countries came up with very innovative systems, though most stuck to the traditional grenade cup. So for example, the Italians had something called the Trombocino, which rather than being a cup that mounts on the end of your rifle, was basically the predecessor of the M203 and other underbarrel grenade launchers. It was a separate barrel that clipped onto the side of a rifle or carbine, and the breech was identical to that used in the standard Carcano rifle. So to use it, you'd actually pull the bolt out of your rifle and put it into the grenade launcher. And this also allowed you to use standard ball ammunition. You didn't need to use blanks. But instead of having the bullet pass through the grenade, there was a mechanism that held the bullet in place and didn't actually let it leave the case. So when the cartridge went off, the case would open up behind the bullet, the gas would come out, and it would launch the grenade. Very slick system. Unfortunately, the diameter, which was uh, 30 millimeters, I believe, uh, was too small to have much of an explosive payload. The Italians didn't find it very useful. It was very short-lived in service. Still, it set the blueprint for what was to come a couple of decades afterward. Another innovative design from between the wars was the Japanese Type 100 cup. And this is interesting because, again, you can use it with live ammunition, but instead of uh, being a shoot-through system or a captive bullet system, uh, this is a gas trap system. So the grenade launching cup is actually offset off the axis of the barrel. So when the bullet goes through, it goes through a little barrel extension, and most of the propellant gas is diverted upwards, like in a gas-operated firearm, and then pushes the grenade out. Very innovative. Um, there's not a lot of data on how often they were used, and they were uh, said to be a little bit awkward to use because you have this big weight mounted above the axis of your rifle. But still, a lot of people were trying many different things. But the system that really stood the test of time was the spigot rifle grenade system. 
So instead of having a cup on the end of the rifle, you had a much thinner spigot, and the grenade had a hollow tail boom unit with a set of fins on it, and this would fit over top of the spigot, and as before, you would load a blank cartridge, and it would launch the grenade and the tail unit off the spigot. Number of advantages to this, number one, you don't have this big heavy cup that's making your rifle front heavy, and if it's large enough diameter, can interfere with your line of sight and the use of the rifle as a normal weapon. And also you're not constrained by the diameter of the cup. So this is very important for things like anti-tank rounds with shape charge warheads because the armor penetration of a shape charge warhead is dependent on its diameter. So since you don't have to constrain the size of your grenade to your cup, you can have as large a diameter grenade as you want. The tail unit is always the same. So spigot grenades were mainly fielded during the Second World War by the United States. And they had the M1 uh, grenade adapter for fitting to the M1903 Springfield rifle, and later the M7 adapter for fitting to the M1 Garand self-loading rifle. And the M7 was a little bit different because of a unique problem with launching grenades off of self-loading rifles, especially gas-activated ones like the Garand. And that's because the increase in pressure and the duration of that pressure needed to launch a grenade compared to a regular bullet, you're putting a lot of stress on the gas system and your bolt is going to open at very high velocity and you can damage the gun after a couple of firings. So the M7 actually had a special component that would cut off the rifle's gas system, basically turning it into a straight pull bolt action rifle. This made it rather hard to use if you, you know, had launched a grenade and you needed to engage the enemy, but as you usually had one grenadier with a bunch of his squad mates with regular rifles, this really wasn't that much of an issue. Now the Germans also had a couple of uh, grenade spigots, but they didn't make much use of them. They stuck with the traditional cup style discharger, one of which we're going to have a look at in just a little bit. Now, after World War II, cup style dischargers sort of fell by the wayside and spigot grenade launchers were the order of the day. And the French especially liked these. They really liked that you could use rifle grenades as a handy form of close fire support without having to lug around heavy mortars and things like that, and made extensive use of them. And in the 1950s, NATO standardized on 22 millimeters as the standard outer diameter of the spigot, inner diameter of the tail unit. And so all NATO countries adopted that standard, as well as non-NATO member Yugoslavia, interestingly enough. So you'll see a lot of Yugoslav SKSs that have that 22 millimeter spigot on them. So there were all sorts of spigot grenades uh, used in the Cold War period. One of the most popular was called the Energa grenade. This was made in Belgium, and it was a rather potent shaped charge warhead. But by the 70s and the 80s, spigot-style grenades were really on their way out in favor of under-barrel grenade launchers like the M203. And really, this made a lot of sense. Number one, the armor on main battle tanks had become so thick by this point that you really couldn't hope to penetrate it with a warhead that was light enough to launch from a regular infantry rifle. So the anti-tank role really passed off to dedicated weapons such as the light anti-tank weapon, the LAW. Also, ammunition for, say, the 40 millimeter grenade is all self-contained. It's a separate cartridge, so it's a lot easier logistically to carry those around rather than having to carry around your blank cartridges and your separate rifle grenade and the discharger on the rifle itself. You just have your underbarrel launcher and your cartridges. It's a lot simpler, and so rifle grenades were more for close infantry support and anti-personnel use. But... The spigot grenade never really died, and today we're seeing sort of a renaissance. Uh, for example, the Japanese have the number six that they use on their rifle. Uh, the Israelis have come up with something called the Simon, or the Simon, uh, which is a door breaching grenade, and this fits over a regular rifle, and it has a standoff fuse on it, so it actually detonates before a door, and it can blow down a door. And a couple of other countries are starting to adopt newer ones because they're a lot more flexible. This is the same problem that we went back to with the original cup dischargers. Uh, you're with a spigot grenade, you can have any sort of warhead you want on the end of it. You're not limited by the diameter of a discharger cup. So more limited use than they used to be, but there's still a place on the modern battlefield for the spigot rifle grenade. Now, enough of me talking. Let's get to the actual hardware and let's do some shooting. 
So the first system we're going to be looking at is the two and a half inch discharger cup, otherwise known as the Burns Cup, which entered service with the British Army in 1917. And it's quite an elegant device. You have this pair of claws and this conical camming surface with a screw. And when you actually turn the cup, that camming surface pushes these claws in and they hook onto these two lightning cuts on the side of a standard short magazine Lee Enfield rifle. Very easy to put on, very easy to take off when you need to. So this is designed to take a standard number five or later number 36 Mills bomb with a gas check plate attached to the bottom. And that would just fit in like this. And you would pull out the safety pin and the walls of the discharger cup would retain the spoon. So the grenade was armed and ready, but not yet dangerous. When you fired it, it would fly free, the spoon would fly free, and then the grenade would be armed and detonate after four seconds if it was a standard grenade or sometimes they had an extended seven second fuse on them to account for the time of flight. Now you notice the grenade is a standard weight. There's no sort of sight on this to adjust the angle of the rifle and the blanks would have been of standard power. So how did you adjust the range? Well, you did that using this little sliding window right here. And that's actually a gas vent. And the idea was you would adjust this to adjust the amount of propellant gas that would actually vent out of the cup before it actually reached the grenade. So if you had this fully open, it would be very short range. If you had it fully closed, the full power of the cartridge would be behind the grenade and it would have a very high range. Now, like I said, designed to use the standard Mills bomb, but later there were smoke and white phosphorus grenades uh, that were designed for it, as well as an armor piercing round. So this was the number 68, and this was developed in 1940, and it was actually one of the very first munitions issued anywhere in the world to use the hollow charge warhead principle. So it was a little cylindrical device with a little fin unit at the back that would fit inside the discharger cup. And that was issued to the British Army starting in 1940. But unfortunately, uh, at that time, it could only penetrate around two, two and a half inches of armor, and it had to hit head on in order to do so. And this made it only marginally more useful than the 55 caliber Boyce anti-tank rifle in use at the time. So the army very quickly rejected it and it was given to units of the Home Guard back in the British Isles. And they retained them in stock until the Home Guard was disbanded in 1944. And speaking of the Home Guard, uh, this is a World War II era rifle. If you see them with these wire wrappings, uh, they're post-World War I. And this is a configuration known as an EY rifle, EY standing for Emergency, it's a very weird acronym. And these were designated grenade launching rifles. The emergency designation basically said like, do not use this as a regular rifle unless you absolutely have to. And they were typically converted from rifles that were designated for drill purposes only, DP rifles. And so in order to make these a little bit stronger for repeated grenade launching, they wrapped the stock in two places with wire and they put this big old cross bolt here. Uh, even so, these were very vulnerable to the stock cracking, especially if you didn't use them properly. And the proper method for using a grenade launching Lee Enfield is actually hold it upside down because this has a more direct line for the force to go through the stock and it will minimize the risk of the stock cracking. So if you look at the manuals, they show the soldier using it in this fashion. So unfortunately, uh, this one, which I've borrowed, is deactivated. So there's a welded plug in the barrel, but since the cup can be removed and added to any Lee Enfield, I'm gonna put it on my SMLE. I've made up some blanks for it. Uh, which are just pulling out the bullet out of regular cartridges and plugging the neck with foam and a little bit of epoxy resin works quite well. And I would love to launch an actual Mills bomb and show you how this would have worked in combat. But unfortunately, this is also on loan. I don't want to lose it and have to pay a couple hundred dollars to the owner. So let's not do that. Let's launch some tennis balls instead. Let's see how it works. Three, two, one, tally-ho! Tally-ho! 
Well, that was a ton of fun. Uh, I have to say that's a really satisfying feeling to feel that pop and see this tennis ball fly that distance. Uh, the blanks are still a little bit inconsistent. I don't have the, the equipment uh, available to make proper crimped blanks, but the methods I'm using seem to be working quite well. I'll try and refine them a little bit more, but hopefully you found that footage as satisfying as I did and got an idea for just how this would have worked under combat conditions. Anyway, next. All right, so the second system we're having a look at is a German Mauser Karabiner KR-98K bolt-action rifle of World War II vintage fitted with a Gewehrgranatgerät, or rifle grenade device, otherwise known as a Schiesbecher, or shooting cup, not to be confused with Scheißbecher, which is something completely different. Now this is issued to German troops starting in 1942 in order to increase the anti-armor capability of the average infantryman. So uh, just like the Burns Cup, uh, this is very easy to attach to the muzzle of either a KR-98K or later the semi-auto Gewehr 43 or even the STG-44 Sturmgewehr. And the inside diameter of this is 30 millimeters, and interestingly enough, the cup is rifled. Now you might think that this is just the Germans over-engineering something that should be quite simple, but there's actually a method to this particular madness. There were three different grenades uh, issued for this. Two of them were shaped charge warheads, which need to hit their target head on in order to work effectively. The grenade can't just tumble. So since there's not a lot of room in here for any sort of stabilizing fins or other mechanism, rifling made sense. So the actual grenades would have had an aluminum driving band at the rear that engaged in the rifling in the cup. So as with the other two systems that we'll be looking at, the grenade was launched by a blank cartridge, only in this case the cartridge actually had a wooden bullet. And what they would do is it would travel up the barrel and hit a special plunger in the base of the grenade and actually arm the fuse before the propellant gas then launched the grenade out of the cup. And because all the different grenades that were issued with this had different weights, there were specific blanks issued for each type of grenade, and to stop them from getting mixed up, the blanks were packaged with the grenades that they corresponded to. So if you got a carton of five of a certain type of rifle grenade, you would then get a stripper clip of five cartridges matched to that grenade packaged along with it. And like I said, there are three different types of grenades. There were a bunch of others, but the three basic ones were a small shape charge warhead, a large shape charge warhead, and a regular uh, anti-personnel grenade, which interestingly enough could be used as a regular hand grenade. You actually unscrewed the base of the grenade and out popped a little string attached to a friction igniter, pull that, throw it, and you had a regular hand grenade, which is sort of the reverse of what you expect. Most countries were taking their regular hand grenades and turning them into rifle grenades. The Germans did it the other way around. Now, you might have noticed you have these grenades of different weights, you have different blank cartridges. How did you vary your range? Well, you did that as with a mortar, by varying the angle of your rifle. And so I don't have one, but this would have originally been issued with a special sight that clamped onto the side of the rifle with a bubble level on it. So you would set it to whatever range you wanted based on what type of grenade you were using, and then you would set the bubble level level to set to the correct angle, and then shoot. Unfortunately, troops found this to be horribly cumbersome, and after a while, those sights were withdrawn from service and replaced instead with instructions on how to use your normal tangent rifle sight for grenade launching. So the army issued special pamphlets that gave the conversion between the range on the rifle sight and the range of the grenade based on what type of grenade you were actually using, and that ended up being a lot more convenient. Now, unfortunately, despite the fact that this was issued to increase anti-armor capability for the average infantryman, uh, as soon as it entered service, it was almost immediately obsolete, because Russian armor, especially uh, KV-1s and T-34s, had armor that you couldn't hope to penetrate with something this small. So these ended up being used mostly in close support anti-infantry roles, or against lighter vehicles, light armor, things like that. And the Schiesbecher was also used to uh, prolonged the life of another obsolete anti-tank weapon, which was the Panzerbüchse uh, uh, 1939, which was an anti-tank rifle that the Germans fielded at the beginning of the war, but very quickly became ineffective against anything but the lightest armored vehicles. So in order to get some use out of them, they chopped down the barrel and put a Schiesbecke on them and used them as dedicated man-portable grenade launchers. 
and in that role they served until the end of the war. So let's actually try this out. This was a little tricky to get working because of the rifling, but I came up with an interesting solution, which was to use the grenade cup itself as a mold and cast a driving band out of aluminum reinforced epoxy putty, and then just popped it out, cleaned it up a little bit, and screwed it to the bottom of a wooden dowel to create a dummy grenade, which fits quite nicely, as you can see. So hopefully on the high-speed footage, we'll be able to see this grenade spiraling out of the cup. It should be some pretty neat footage. Uh, unfortunately, because this is a very lightweight wooden dowel, it doesn't have the moment of inertia to actually stabilize itself. So if we do see it flying through the air, it's probably going to tumble end over end. But uh, what can you do with the materials and resources available? But again, enough of me talking. Let's shoot. Well, that worked a little too well. Uh, still have to dial in those blanks. We, ne we never were able to find those two grenades that we launched with the full power blanks. Uh, you'll notice that there was some footage there where the grenade didn't go very far at all. Well, in order to get some usable footage, I actually switched to using a 22 caliber replica of a Mauser 98 that I had, which just happened to have the exact same dimensions for the barrel. And so the shoe spec actually fit perfectly on it. And I had some 22 caliber blanks, which allowed me to demonstrate the grenade actually leaving the barrel without actually losing the grenade. So, you know, kind of a fun little thing to play around with, but yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to dial those blanks back in so I can actually find these grenades, because they do take quite a long time to make. But you can see some of the power behind some of these cartridges, how far you can actually launch these grenades and how effective that would have been in combat. And finally, we come to the MOS 3651. So the MOS 36 was originally designed as part of a large rearmament program in the 1930s, where the French were going to replace all of their older rifles based on the 8mm Labelle cartridge with new ones based on the 7.5 cartridge. And the frontline troops would get a nice semi-automatic rifle, which eventually became the MOS 44 and the MOS 49. And second-line troops, drivers, mechanics, um, artillerymen, would get the bolt-action MOS 36. Unfortunately, due to delays caused by politics, the French changing governments every six months or so, uh, this was significantly delayed, and the MOS 36 ended up being pressed into service just as World War II broke out. So it saw a little bit of service before France capitulated. It saw some service with collaboration as Vichy French forces. Some made it out of France to free French forces, uh, but eventually they were re-equipped with British and then American equipment. But after the war, the MOS 36 continued in production and large numbers of them saw service in Algeria and in Indochina. Now, during World War II, the French didn't have a grenade launching rifle, but immediately afterwards, they came out with what was known as the LG-48, LG standing for Lance Grenade, grenade launcher. And it was a regular uh, MOS 36 with a grenade launching spigot and the bomb for it was modified from a pre-war model of 1937 mortar with a new tail unit attached. And this was a little bit smaller than the spigot you see right here. I don't have an LG-48 with me, but I do have the Syrian contract MOS-49, and you can see it has a significantly different type of grenade launching spigot on the end of it here. This is about 15 millimeters instead of 22 millimeters. However, in the 50s, when NATO standardized on 22 millimeters for the standard grenade spigot, uh, the French adopted that, and this uh, ended up with the MOS 36 51. So, uh, very different from the two other rifles we've looked at. This uses a spigot style grenade that fits over the muzzle just like that. Now, this also uses a blank launching cartridge, though later the French would develop a bullet trap grenade, which had a series of baffles in the tail. So you could use live ammunition. The bullet would just get caught in these baffles, and then the 
propellant gas would launch the grenade off of the muzzle. Now you would hold this at 45 degrees using this sight right here, which folds out at 45 degrees so you can hold that flat to the ground. And how you adjust the range on this is again, a very different system from the other two that we've already looked at. You would spin this little worm gear on the nose cap here, and this pushes this plunger up and down the spigot. And what that does is adjust how far back or forward the grenade sits on the spigot. So if it's all the way back, it has more room to accelerate. It's gonna be going faster when it leaves the spigot. It's gonna have a higher range. If it's all the way up front, it's not going to go very far. So very elegant system. So this type of grenade launcher would be applied to the Moss 49 and finally the Moss 4956, which is a semi-automatic rifle. But there, uh, because of the problem that I talked about earlier with the American rifle grenade launchers with uh, using a gas system and overloading the gas system because of the increased pressure, when you open the sight on a Moss 4956, uh, it actually shut off the gas system so you wouldn't have that problem. Anyway, enough of me talking. Let's actually try this one out. So, like with the German grenade launcher, that went a little too well. Uh, the first uh, grenade, the one with the blue painted tail unit that I launched, uh, we never ended up finding that one. It was gone from sight almost immediately. Uh, whereas the second one that you saw with the tennis ball in it, we did find, but in a rather mangled state. And because it just had a tennis ball in it, this is probably just the acceleration and the aerodynamics that bent the claws back on the grenade adapter. So. Really going to have to dial some of those blanks in to get them to work properly and actually make this uh, a fun system to actually use. And there you have it, three very different rifle grenade systems demonstrated right before your eyes. I hope you had fun with this video and found it informative. I certainly had fun making it despite some of the surprises and pitfalls along the way. Uh, before I end this video, I really want to give a huge shout out to people without whom this video would not have been possible. Uh, thank you to Sarah Lazar and Martin Hageman for helping with the filming. It really made things a lot easier with all the other different moving parts that had to be coordinated for this. Thank you to Gord Crossley of the Fort Garry Horse Museum for lending me the KR-98K and the Schiesbecker Grenade Cup. And to Rob Love for lending me the EY Enfield Rifle and the Burns Discharger Cup. Uh, it really made for a uh, much better and much more comprehensive video. So thank you to all of you. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll be looking at more fascinating artifacts just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier. Have a great day.